pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming and spending this glorious fall day, spring day, whatever it is, inside. Um, yeah, I want to talk to you about, the first of all, briefly, maybe re redundancy to Tim, but the reason we have a global warming problem is we started the Industrial Revolution way back and started burning fossil fuels. I was born in 1942. And even though this picture taken two years before me looked like all the people on Earth have gathered on Coney Island, I love that picture. It, in fact, when I was born in 1942, there were just less than two billion people on the planet. And burn what we were, we couldn't impact the climate like we can now, and we're actually at 7.8 billion this year. You know, it's really a mixture of burning fossil fuels and people. And uh, those are the two causes. And so when, when we look at, uh, well, here's one on, on the energy resources as of 2017. And you can see that 90% of all of our energy or more is coming from burning of, of biofuels, peat, wood, and coal, oil, and gas. Um, the other is increasing, but this is our problem. And you can see the increase through time. That goes from 1800 to 1900 to 2017. You can see how, especially after World War II, population started to go up and we started to really increase the use of fossil fuels, though per capita it's gone down. Now, another thing that's really important, this is, the blue line is a model of of trying to model climate temperature without putting in the buildup of greenhouse gases that we've put in. And if we don't put them in, we wouldn't have warming, okay? And that's the, only when you put them in do the models, the red zone, start to approximate what we've seen. In other words, since about 1950, we have been controlling climate, period. The ups and downs of of solar radiation and everything else. We're overwhelming everything, so that's an important thing. And the other thing is that, that we're forecast to have a lot more heat in the atmosphere and a lot more warm days. This is, um, I think by the middle of the century, this is how many days above 90 degrees. Well, you can see central and southern Florida are gonna have two or three months more days above 90 degrees. That's a challenge. The real problem, the reality of global warming is that it is the, the sun's radiation coming in at short wavelengths, bouncing off as a longer wavelength radiation off the earth, and that longer wavelength being caught by these greenhouse gases. That's what's warming the atmosphere. If that was the end of the story, it would be so easy. It would be so easy to stop global warming. You'd just stop putting greenhouse gases in and you'd pull them out and it would cool down. But oh, as of 2014, over 93% of all the extra global warming heat from burning fossil fuels has transferred to the ocean. So global warming is really warming the ocean. And as you remember from high school physics, water has an amazing capacity to take in and hold heat, and that's exactly what it's doing. And the light blue is, is above, I think, 700 meters, and the dark blue is, is the heat building up deeper in the ocean. And this is doing two things. It's both causing the ocean to rise, and that warm water is now, since the mid-90s, getting in around Greenland and Antarctica and starting to accelerate ice melt. Um, and the 2% that's in the atmosphere is, is this little bit. This thing's hard to use. You can see the little dark red line there. That's the 2% that's in the atmosphere. That's what we're fighting over or trying to come to an agreement on in the Paris Accord. And if you were born in... 1997, half of the heat has gone into the ocean since you were born. 
And if we decided in 1987 to get hold of this problem, it would have been a fourth the problem it is now. So we're really cranking the heat up, so to speak. This is an attempt by Jim Hansen at a graph of uh, global sea level rise since 1900. And you can see and still about, until about 1930, the rate of rise was very slow. It was six centimeters per century. That's just over two inches. And then about 1930, it started to pick up further and it more than doubled. And this is because the warming ocean was starting to expand. And then in the early 90s, there's another kick up in the rate of global sea level rise, again doubling, but now also accelerating. And that's when we really started to have ice melt on Greenland and Antarctica from both warming atmosphere and a warming ocean getting in underneath the ice. And because of that, we have um, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, does not have a valid sea level projection because they do not recognize and incorporate what Greenland and Antarctica are doing. This is from the 2017 uh, NOAA US government projection of sea level rise. They had six scenarios. The lower three I left off because we're already basically above those. And, uh, but the three that are there, the intermediate high, which by the end of the century, the right side, oh, I screwed up. This button, there we go. Um, the intermediate high is about five feet, uh, a meter and a half by the end of the century. The high is two meters, 6.6 .6 feet. And the extreme is, is they project because of faster accelerating ice melt could be two and a half meters or 8.2 feet. This is global. And to make that work for you in Sarasota or me in Miami, we have to find out what other regional influences there will be. There are two. We sit on limestone, so we're not sinking like some other areas so much. Uh, we're south of where the ice melt is still having an effect, north of Savannah, uh, where the land's collapsing. But we have two things that affect peninsular Florida on both coasts. One is that we have the, the, uh, the current coming here and swinging around and becoming the Florida current and then the Gulf Stream. And this current, as it, it's a huge current. As it flows north, it, the water turns to the right because of the Coriolis effect and it raises up the water level. In the upper right, I show a sketch of a difference between Miami and Bimini in ocean level. Bimini is about a meter higher, over three feet higher, because of that Coriolis effect. If and when this current slows down, that piling up of water on the Atlantic Ocean side decreases and everything on this side gets a rise of sea level. And there are times when it does slow down and we get a foot or two foot rise of sea level along the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast. And this is forecast to maybe add another 15 to 25 percent of sea level rise to our global projection this century for the areas on the left side of, of this current, including where we are here. That's one thing. The other one is something that is a little hard at first to grasp, but it's important. The ice in Greenland and Antarctica is an absolutely huge mass of stuff. And just like the moon pulls the tides as it goes around, these big masses of ice pull the water toward it. And as this ice is melting, it's gradually diminishing its pull. And as you see in the, in the, the right panel there, you can see the light blue is as the ice melts, the water will go elsewhere. It won't be pulled as, as much. And when I first heard this, I said, yeah, whatever. No, this is real. The next thing is a, a time lapse from 2002 to, uh, to the present. 
if we get it going. They will make it happen. They will make it happen back there. This is so worth seeing. Because at, notice at first, everything is sort of in the middle, in the green, and there, there, it, and as it turns red, where the ice is melting, and the water is pulling away, that will go down maybe five centimeters over this 12-year period. And where the water is getting bluer, the ocean is rising. Now it's seasonal, right? You can see it up and down seasonal. But you can see the Florida Peninsula and some other areas are really starting to turn blue. We're at 2010. Look how red it is in, around Greenland and Alaska and starting on Antarctica. That's because even with the little melt we've had, the water is pulling away. And it's going again. But this is, you get it? This is real. This is just water level from melting of ice and the water's pulling away. You understand that? It's, it's, it's like, oh, well, we thought that was about 20% additional also to our sea level rise. Um, Isabella Velocogna out at University of California, Irvine says no, for California and the Florida Peninsula, that should be an additional 52%. So you have five feet, no, you get seven and a half feet instead. Okay? Whoop, sorry. Um, so what we have to do now, with those two things alone, when we look at Florida, we have to take the global curve and say, well, no, maybe we could have an additional 20% from each of those, or maybe an additional 15 and 52%. And our sea level projection curves actually will look like this. This is with 20% uh, and 20%. This is with 15 and 52. And you can see, we go from having 5 to 8.2% to, 8 .2 to uh, feet of sea level rise to having 7 to 12 feet by the end of the century, or if we use the higher one, which is more likely, 8.5 to 13 feet by the end of the century. Whoa. And this, importantly, I heard Longboat Key, if you're on any barrier island and you start talking about 2 or 3 feet of sea level rise, which could be <coughs> within a mortgage cycle, the, the old mortgage cycle when you could get 30 years on buying a property. There's some places in Miami-Dade County where you can only get a 15-year mortgage cycle now. That really kills the value of your house. So anyhow, you start to see how critical this is in, in thinking about our future. And 6.2 feet, which on the old global diagram was somewhere way out when we're all dead and uh, and we'll solve it by then anyhow, supposedly, but we've warmed the ocean. But um, you can see this could be almost within 50 years, six feet. Well, let's start with a place that's far and distant from you, Miami-Dade County and Broward County. And this is looking at where I live, and uh, Lynn and I live, and this is two, four, six, eight feet. Uh, by some time, and uh, w we aren't like Sarasota. Sarasota, you drive in and you go up, and you eventually end up on Trail Ridge or whatever it's called, and, and you're nice and high. Here, we go over our little tiny hill, and we're in the Everglades. You drop into the Everglades. So we're in dire trouble, and, uh, but let's look at uh, well, this is our problem. We can't build levees even because we're on this horrendously porous limestone or sand. And you have a bit of that problem too. Um, and those maps I just showed you do not include the king tides, the big tides of the year. Um, and, and for people that think, well, this is something in the future. No, this is Fort Lauderdale a couple of years ago during a king tide. You know? And that's a1A, that was supposed to be where you, you play on the beach and park your car, and, and it's here. Sea level rise is here. In S Miami area, we've had just over a foot since 1930 of sea level rise, okay? 
Um, the other thing those maps don't put in, and you're starting to learn about these on this coast too, and that's hurricanes. This is a category two Hurricane Ike that hit the Boulevard Peninsula just east of Galveston at, uh, back in 2008, and it just wiped everything off. It's so low and vulnerable, and all our barrier islands are gonna become so low and vulnerable. And, uh, and this is, for those of you that remember last summer, this is Dorian coming on to the Bahamas, that noticed the cargo containers here and the houses. Well, here are the cargo containers. Oh, stop it. The cargo containers are, are spread all along here. You can see them way down at the bottom here, though my follow the yellow lines. This thing won't point down there. And uh, a storm surge is not a high tide. So when you plan when you're gonna buy or where you're gonna buy or when you're gonna sell, storm surge is this lateral push of water like a tsunami video you see in Japan, except it's with a 140 mile an hour wind pushing the water. It's the most violent thing you can imagine, and it's trying to flatten everything in its path. And so when you talk about storm surges, here was the storm surge in Miami-Dade County from uh, Hurricane Andrew in 1992 on the left. And Brian Soden at the University of Miami modeled Hurricane Andrew with a further three feet of sea level rise. And it's, it's, it's more than three feet higher. It goes in forever. And it's just overwhelming influence. So this is the kind of thing that's gonna move us on if the 15 year mortgage and the lack of being able to get insurance haven't done it already. Uh, a few years ago, the people in Naples, just south of you here, thought that Global warming was a Miami problem because we, for some reason, get all the press about it. No, it's maybe more so in Naples. Here's a six foot rise of sea level, which remember, will be by the end of the century or earlier. Wow. And uh, here's Peninsular Florida. These are maps by the late Peter Harlem, who was a student of mine years ago and, and uh, died in 2016. But, um, and I've paired them with a night map so you know where we live. So as you see, and I only am using three of these, uh, here's eight feet. And you can see most of the bright lights on the southeast coast are overwhelmed as is Naples and Marco and things down at the end there. But you can, uh, uh, you can see of course, Sanibel and, and parts of, of Fort Myers are overwhelmed and Cape Coral and on up towards you. Um, and uh, here we are with, with uh, 16 feet and here we are with 24 feet. And since we've warmed the ocean, I can't imagine any way we're just gonna turn this around tomorrow even though the mayor of my Miami Beach tells his people, don't worry about inundation. We're taking care of that. It's wonderful to listen to. <laughs> Every community is afraid of losing their tax base, you know? Um, Every one of those communities that's no longer there. So these, that's really an amazing thing. Let me just quickly come in closer for you. So here's from uh, Bradenton, Sarasota, down to Port Myers and Cape Coral. Same map, I just came in a little closer so you get an idea. And uh, yeah, unbelievable, isn't it? Unbelievable what we have done. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And uh, and, and as Tim said, um, we've done enough buildup of greenhouse gases to get up to 20 meters or so above sea level, 70 feet or so. Here's just the final one of these local area with uh, Cape Coral, Fort Myers, Sanibel, Captiva, two feet, four feet, you know, the barrier islands are all over, but a lot of our low-lying coastal area is 
And a lot of our low-lying coastal area, like Cape Coral and others, is actually was too low to live on, so they dredged up canals and lakes and built up the land to six feet. And then at six feet, it's over, because that's how high your land was built up to. That was sort of reclaimed swamp land. Okay, and uh, any barrier island, as sea level rises, we're gonna be eroding it. Even if it looks like it's still there, sand's gonna be washed over, washed out, or increasing tidal currents through the inlets are gonna raise havoc near those. And, uh, and the, the barrier island will either move beyond you, like happened there, or uh, it will just be left behind if sea level rises too fast. And we have many examples on our continental shelf of that having happened in the past. Um, so uh, I think by the middle of the century, we're gonna be scared of the ocean. Right now, if we have enough money, we run out and buy a $10 million property on it, but that's gonna, that's gonna chase, hit, change. Here's so South Captiva. The red is the areas above five feet above sea level, so at a good high tide with two and a half feet of sea level rise, that would be all that's left of Captiva, except it's just sand, and, and Captiva is actually gonna look like the picture on the right. It's just gonna have washed away. And so as lovely as these are, and every picture I've shown you are just wonderful places, uh, but I hope you start to appreciate how vulnerable every bit of this is to the reality of what lies before us this century, not some century down the road. Modelers get the trends right, but if you go just by the models, we're essentially always getting the rates wrong. They're way too slow. Michael Mann is the top climate scientist at Penn State right now, and he he says sea ice decline is decades of, that's the floating ice in the Arctic, is decades ahead of when models predicted. Melting of polar ice sheets may occur more rapidly than previously predicted, and we could see disastrous consequences of all aspects of climate change far sooner than models predicted. That's important for you to understand, and I have one thing that gets into the area that I've done my research and my students, and that is that looking at the past and figuring out how it worked, because on the left is the last interglacial 120,000 years ago, and sea level was about six meters, about 20 feet higher. Apparently, we now know from work last year that that was almost all from the melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet and a very rapid melting, it looks like it was. Um, and then eventually we went down into this ice age because of how we presented ourselves to the sun, as Tim showed you. And we were over 420 feet lower because of so much ice on land. And, um, and that's where we were 18,000 years ago. And the important question for today is, how do we get from here to here, to this one on the right? This thing doesn't know how to work, but um, that's really important. And, um, and the answer is, a lot of us have been working. Obviously, it had to rise quite quickly, but all across the continental shelves are old barrier islands, old tidal inlet deltas that had built up to sea level, old reefs and reef flats, old coastal mud flats that are just left on the continental shelf. And they represent a still stand of sea level to build the barrier island. And then they represent a rapid rise that leaves it there or that overwhelms the reef so fast that the reef growth can't keep up. We now, uh, we've been working on this since the 80s, but we now see that the whole way, sea level rise is nothing more than pauses and then rapid pulses of rise. And each pulse represents the rapid disintegration of some ice sheet sector, okay? That's how it worked in the past, the whole way, whether it's fast or slow, 
when s the, r the big sea level rises are because of ice melt and when ice starts to melt to use Jim Hansen's word it disintegrates and uh, that is not in any of the models I have showed you today that concept that understanding it's uh, most of the models of sea level rise are la di da you know gradual melt gradual sea level rise you'll be okay I can come in with my engineering firm and protect you and take your money and it'll all be okay um, but that's not how it worked and you now understand that so when you look at all these projections you know it's a little more disturbing than that okay we can measure a lot of the past directly the ice when it builds up on these Greenland and Antarctica or the Alpine glaciers it traps atmosphere as little bubbles you can see on the right and you we can drill down and get year-by-year year atmospheres and test them and we can get the carbon dioxide and the methane levels and other things in there and here's just an example of that for the last 400,000 years and then the top you can see we went naturally again Tim showed you this this is really fundamental we went from 180 in the ice glacial times to 280 in the interglacial the warm times like today and sea level the blue and the bottom was going up and down in concert about a hundred meters okay and uh, and what you see at the end is that the beginning of the industrial revolution we were right at 220 and then we increased to 380 280 to 380 and now we're at 414 or so that's 134 parts per million 100 parts per million did 100 meters of sea level rise from ice melt we don't have enough ice left to do another 100 meters but we can do a lot we can do 60 or 65 and some other things will probably make it more but and so there's the reality in the red graph what's the blue graph going to look like we have increased this greenhouse gas levels we have increased those by 130 some parts per million the last hundred parts per million we did in the last 60 years it took it took 16,000 years to do the other part you know the natural part we've done this over a hundred times faster and it just by the 1990s well by the 1930s we'd gotten enough to start expanding the ocean remember the global graph and by the 1993 we started to melt ice and we started to see the sea level rise kicking up from that that's a really important graph I hope you get it and uh, with what little time I have left I don't know how much but we'll find out when they yell at me um we're going to see continued warming of the huh or 20 uh, <laughs> um, we're going to see continued warming of the world's oceans we're going to see continued melt of alpine glaciers these are pictures my dad took on the left and the one Lynn took with me and, and later and you can go do this and you can look on the internet and do this but this is really dramatic loss from melting of alpine glaciers but the big story is in Greenland and Antarctica okay and Greenland is ice melt is of course mostly on land and it's and it melts and here you're seeing the progressive increase in summer melt from 292 in the salmon to 2005 to when Lynn and I flew down there in 2012 <laughs> 98 percent of the ice sheet up over 10,000 feet in elevation was melting in July for a couple of weeks it was unbelievable and uh, uh, you must go to Greenland it's, it's the most beautiful place Lynn and I have been and it's also the most sobering as far as climate change and uh, they're nice places to stay if you have your friend with five or six thousand dollars to rent a helicopter you can enjoy it uh, and go out wherever you want the amazing thing about this picture 
though, is that a year before, the ice sheet was where Lynn's standing. Yeah, right. This is unbelievable. And it's melting at a phenomenal rate. Remember how the water was turning red because it was subsiding around it? Um, and what's happening is there's the warmed atmosphere is melting like crazy on the surface and it's sinking down sinkholes they call moulins, melt holes, and the ice is being lifted off the bottom by the water and it's starting to move faster and it's crevassing all up. And as the surface is melting, it's turning dirty because of all the Gobi Desert dust and the black soot and the brown soot that was in the building ice. That's now exposed on the surface, which accelerates ice melt, dark stuff. And uh, that's only part of the story, is the warmed atmosphere. And it turns out this year, we're now getting reports of heavy rains on Antarctica. That wasn't reported before. And so we're now having, because of atmospheric warming, we're having melt on the surface of Antarctica too. But the big story on both of them is that we're having water, um, warm ocean water getting in under the outlet fjords on Greenland and Antarctica. And it is, it is starting to melt. The little sad is where the little red arrow is up there. That's where we went. And uh, the little sat's up there in the corner. This is the Jacob Shaven Ice Shore. And the, uh, uh, we were there in 2012 and 13. And they had a National Science Foundation camp where the star is. The, the collapsing calving face had retreated from this 2007 image back to where the arc is in 2012. We got out there, you could see the 100 meter high calving front. You can see, what a beautiful campsite. Oh man, a little cold sometimes, but beautiful. And they had all kinds of gadgets trying to measure the dynamics of the ice, and they, they and others still do. And, um, and the, the first summer we were there, this calving events was happening like three or four times a day. Unbelievable, okay? And it used to be once or twice a week, but these are major events. There's a thing called Chasing Ice, you can look it up, get a YouTube of it, that's taken from here of some of these calving events. But the reason that the, the ice melt had accelerated inland is that, that the warm water from the ocean, the red, is going in on the bottom from the ocean on the left and melting deep in under the ice sheet. And we took a fixed wing plane and went in and, uh, uh, oh no, well we also did a, a little boat trip out where the red arrow is, um, where there's a, a moraine and the, the big icebergs are grounded on it. So we went out and uh, what, I, what I'd done was take a thermometer um, that could go down to a thousand feet and I had a water sampler and I put a five pound rock on it and we lowered it down. And down to about 700 feet, the, the line just hung straight. And then all of a sudden we went a little deeper and the, the, the line took a 20 degree swing going in, trying to go in under the, the ice in the fjord and the, the temperature on the thermometer warmed up from half a degree to two degrees and we got marine stuff. So we were getting into the base here of the water going in. This is a picture of the Greenland with the ice taken off and where the blue starts that's where the ice sheet is covering it and that's the deep fjord. We followed that fjord up on a fixed wing plane for about 80 miles in on the ice sheet up to over 2,000 feet elevation and we followed the the deep fjord because the ice had collapsed above it. That's about five or six hundred feet below the level of the ice sheet and it was frightfully fractured and it was frightfully um, well, fractured so that at times this stuff squirts out, you know, five kilometers of ice coming out these shores in a week or so. It's sort of like toothpaste. And on both Greenland and Antarctica, we're seeing now an accelerating ice melt. Um, the, this is measured here by the, the GRACE satellites that measure mass or gravity under the, a spot. And they do this over all the pixels of Greenland. And you can see the, the summer melt 
from 2002 on and the winter buildup of ice and the summer melt and you can see that this is accelerating downward, steepening downward at least through 2012 and it is now again and uh, uh, that's an acceleration of melt. That's what we're seeing. And uh, uh, the same thing's happening on, in Antarctica where we're seeing warm water get in under the edge and that's getting in underneath causing melting and, and it's causing thinning. Here's one out of a graph. And so this ice melt, this is the huge concern, okay? And uh, the, the, keep your eyes out on the Pine Island and the Thwaites. And uh, that is huge, but there's also the East Antarctic ice sheet over on the right is, is one that you might worry about. And this is rapidly accelerating the ice melt on Antarctica. You know, if you were investing in something that was tripling every decade, it would be great. Well, this is something you should be deeply concerned about because that's what's happening. Okay, and uh, I'm going to skip on because I sort of have had my allotted time. So I'm going to just run through these again to remind you where you are. Eight feet, 16 feet, 24 feet. And we have a choice of making our future a progressive orderly process in which we can plan and help the affected families, businesses, communities, and cleaning the land before inundation. That's our 145 foot high Mount Trashmore south of Miami and Turkey Point. Or if we don't plan, we're truly heading into catastrophic chaos creation of huge numbers of dislocated indigents. These are the, the modern day Okies that have to move off their land because they have nothing. And we're going to leave, which bothers me most, if we don't clean our land before it's inundated, what are we leaving our children? A terribly polluted, useless place that could be a great new place for snorkeling on your old house and all these other things. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>